Diese Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is Ulrich Diernagel and um, this is a very exciting event. Uh, I guess it's pretty new for all of us um, to not go to meetings but to go to meeting and to um, attend these webinars or these, these web conferences. So I hope everything uh, will run smoothly. Let me just before we start give you um, a few hints. Um, first of all, uh, everyone should uh, mute his or her microphone. It, it may even be muted by the organizer. I don't know whether this works and also turn off your webcam. Um, very important, um, please, if you um, have questions to the speaker, um, please uh, put them into the chat. So if you if you look at your screen, there's a, a bubble up there, a speech bubble. If you click that, you can open a chat. And if you can can type in your question, you can do it during the talk. Uh, you can do it afterwards. We will collect the questions and I will then direct them um, to our speaker. So we will not be able to have kind of live questions. But uh, I think uh, that works reasonably well if you if you give us your questions via um, the chat function. Um, another short note is that this lecture will be recorded. So um, if your questions uh, are kind of sensitive and you don't want them um, on, on record, um, either don't ask them or ask or tell us to remove it from, uh, from the recording. Um, there is a Twitter handle, handle at uh, Berlin Innovation, which I, I guess will also be used to, to chat about uh, the, the lecture. So, um, welcome again. Um, what's a bit spooky for a speaker, and I think it will be also spooky for our speakers, that we're, we're now talking not in front of an audience, but into, into the void, into, or in fact, into our monitor, and we don't really know um, whether we reach anyone. So I, I really hope that um, uh, audio and video are, are okay um, and you can follow the lecture. So without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, announce uh, our speaker of uh, this event, uh, of, of this series. Um, uh, it's uh, Georg Duda. Uh, many of us know him very well. Um, just a few uh, uh, words of introduction. Uh, so uh, he, Georg received his PhD in 1996. Um, he is uh, at the Charité since 1997. Um, he is the vice director of the Berlin Brandenburg Center for Regenerative Therapies, which is now the, I think, BIH Center for Regenerative Therapies and the director of the Julius Wolf Institute for Biomechanics and Musculoskeletal Regeneration at the Charité. Um, he is working at the interface between medicine, biology, and engineering. His work is particularly focused at biological regeneration in the musculoskeletal system. Um, he holds an associate faculty position at the WIS Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. I think he will tell us what it takes to translate because uh, the complex process of translation was always pivotal, not only in his research, but also on a conceptual and structural level locally at the BCRT or in his function as a member of the Senatskommission for Grundsatzfragen. So without further ado, I pass on the microphone to Georg, please. Uli, and uh, I hope that you can hear me and uh, I'm supposed to click the video button also. And um, I have no idea if you see me, um, but 
let's assume it is the case. So it's um, a new experience for all of us, as Uli said, and um, it's a great pleasure to have that opportunity. And it's a big challenge to see how it runs in that first um, uh, conference that we're meeting that we organize this way. I have been asked to say something about translation and I choose the title, um, what does it take to translate um, on purpose? Because um, we have we have that and uh, we, we have um, learned over the last couple of years from different perspectives on how translation works. But probably it's most interesting for many of you to learn when it doesn't work and what lessons people have learned during their tries to translate. And that's why I would like to focus in that uh, next 45 minutes on how did we translate, where were we successful, where were we probably not so successful and what were potential reasons. In that lecture series you have heard earlier about um, the very initial phase of initiating your hypothesis, making sound basic research possible, and having safe data, secure data, and reliable data produced. I will not concentrate as much on those aspects. I'd like to go beyond and try to probably think from, or invite you to look from the back when things really came to patients and what made them different in terms of a translation success and eventual uh, potential failure in translation. Before doing so, I have a certain block of advertisement and that's this one. Um, I'm very happy and very proud that I can chair the US Wolf Institute and uh, most of you probably are not familiar what the US Wolf Institute is standing for and what is US Wolf, what's the name? US Wolf was, uh, the first orthopedic surgeon at the Charité. He was uh, heavily fighting to become uh, an academic member of the medical faculty Charité um, when he you had his practice on orthopedics in the Luisenstraße. And he became member at the time when Virchow did his pathology. Uh, Koch was heavily active and um, he initiated not only that orthopedics became an academic uh, element in medicine, but also he identified that bone as a structure is only present if it's mechanically loaded. He had an engineer, Kuhlmann, who did the calculations for him, and he showed, together they showed, that mechanical forces impact the structure of bone. And our institute is in exactly that tradition. Nowadays, we know that uh, stem cells, stem cell differentiation, are heavily impacted by physical cues, be it straining, be it geometry, and physical function matters. And we are now learning the hard way that cells are not really living on a glass dish or petri dish, but in 3D environments. And they are not only loosely sitting there, but they're actually active mechanical actors, and they are also seeing physical forces. In that tradition, we're trying to understand how regeneration works. And that's the other element that I'm super proud of that we could realize here, a, or we're working to realize a campus on regenerative medicine with um, really the trying to understand the endogenous cascades of healing and what it takes to actually regenerate um, tissue homeostasis, the dynamics of tissue function. You see here an example of a regenerating limb of an axolotl. And on the right-hand side, you see an one of the first cards that we produced for our graduate school when we kicked off that as a DFG funded uh, graduate school. Unfortunately, we're unable to regrow our limbs and restore the full function and processes as the axolotls can do. However, um, healing in some tissues is super conserved and bone is one of them. That's the fascination why I'm personally so interested in bone healing. And you see here an example of an frog tibia from the last ice age. Uh, initially, we thought it's uh, basically here a, sort of a tumor formation. But if you really section and look carefully, you realize the bone has a callus formation and there is a super big callus forming that really resembles a healing cascade. 
So why are we interested in bone? Bone can heal scar-free and is only one of two tissues that actually can do that. The liver is the other. That scar-free healing capacity is something that we would like to unravel, learn from, and then transfer to other tissues that don't have that intrinsic capacity of scar-free healing. It's kind of probably naive to think we do that in tissues that have not that capacity. Uh, that's why we thought we start with tissues that have the capability. If we look really into other examples, um, now here from our National Museum in Berlin, you see even whatever dinosaur you look at, they all have bones that have seen a fracture and they have callus formation. So bone healing or restoring tough tissues is um, as a healing process of scar-free regeneration is something that's super conserved and uh, is working in young individuals and it's working in many species and it seems to work across multiple cascades of ages or decades of age. But if it doesn't work, then we don't have a, science, a basic science concern. We also have a clinical challenge. And it's actually roughly more than 10% of fracture patients that experience a delayed healing or non-union situation. And that's one example at the bottom where revision surgery was necessary um, after the primary fracture treatment, the non-union had to be treated, an additional stimulating therapy was necessary, a revision situation, something that easily takes more than a year, sometimes two or more years for a patient. And there are two extreme situations, young individuals with a trauma event, um, accident, sport accident, car accident, they are in the middle of the life and they want to return fast. And you have the second peak with the older people, mainly women, suffering fractures if the bones are getting too weak. Um, we really don't know how many of the patients are really seeing delayed healings, but we know with an aging population that we will see more and more fractures coming. And we have a certain understanding that elderly patients somehow see a delayed or a less successful healing cascade than the younger ones, which is not completely surprising, but to some, time, some degree it's surprising because it illustrates that healing that is happening in the young and healing that's happening in the aged seem to be identical cascades. But just be aware, the metabolic profile has substantially changed. The immune experience of the individuals has substantially changed. The mechanical environment has changed. The structure is different. So basically everything is different, but the process still works. And that's the focus of our research group uh, that is funded by the German Research Foundation, where we try to understand regeneration in aged individuals and how it differs from the one in young. Now I told you a little bit the setting where we're coming from, what are we really known for and why am I talking about translation? Uh, we are known as an institute and pretty proud um, about a couple of things that we're really uh, taking aware or where awareness is on a global scale. And I'd like to give you a couple of examples in a second. Um, what it really takes to get those discussions going um, and with things that really become a global standard, you definitely have realized the translation. All the examples that I'm going to show you are based on basic research, mainly funded by the German Research Foundation and later additional co-funding sources. So saying that, it means you need a basic understanding. Translation requires, and that's also a personal impression, but I think that's generally understood more and more, requires crossing borders. So you need to understand the medical need, understand it in depth. So the medical need needs to be characterized. You need to have a mechanistic knowledge or gain mechanistic knowledge or try to get as close as possible. You need an innovative technology. You need the combination of the two, mechanistic understanding and medical need and then the technology. You need a dissemination and in the end you try to really get it promoted and out to the people and a broader acceptance. With that, translation is probably not only trying to be first in a patient. Maybe translation is if you install the reimbursement of your new therapy, and you can be very proud if you realize that, but probably translation is actually if you establish a new standard of care locally, nationally, or internationally on a global scale. 
One example that goes in that direction is we have been able to develop a technology that allows to measure in patients the forces that are acting in a hip joint, in a knee joint, and in a shoulder and spine joint. And that's the work of Georg Bergmann and Philipp Damm that you can see hopefully in the top corner. And we have a very unique set of patients, 10, that are currently running. And we had a second generation or a first generation of patients that were eight patients. They are 20 years older, uh, in which we can really live monitor the forces that they have. We're really talking about macro mechanics, the forces that they have in the hip joint. And we have a unique set of patients, nine patients, where we measure the forces in the knee joint. In both cases, we're the only ones globally that are capable to do that and really measure those forces. This is just one example of one of our younger patients. He has a knee replacement and he tries to stand on one foot and he's frustrated that he cannot. You see the video in the bottom right corner, you see in the top left corner here, you see um, the black line and the black line tells you the forces and the forces are presented in terms of percent body weight. So a scale of 400 means four times body weight. And if you look at that curve, it actually reaches close to six times body weight. I'm playing that again. So when he tries to stand on his knee or one leg, he reaches easily nine, uh, six times body weight in forces in that leg. Why is that possible? Because muscle contraction leads to such high forces. Um, that means, and apparently he has a hip problem and a lack of gluteal muscle forces, and that leads him to come to such instable situations and a lack of being stable. That's one of our older patients, and she's doing the same exercise. She stands on one leg, but if you call, see at her, she basically reaches here three times body weight in that activity. And then she's super frustrated that she couldn't do more. And if you really look carefully, you saw she's actually standing on a swing platform. So much more challenging situation. What does it tell us? It basically illustrates the relevance of muscle forces, the relevance of the musculoskeletal chain that drives the forces that are acting in the physiological situation of activities. Since we're the only one that are capable to measure in patients, that led to us to produce, and that was the idea of Georg Berkman, a globally accessible database platform that everybody can use. And that led that our data is a standard for any implant, hip, knee joint, spine joint, shoulder joint that is reaching the market and comes to patients that has to go through standard testing and all the standards in the US, in Europe, and in Asia are based on our data. And also all companies who see failures come to us and approach us and wanna know if the failure is a surgeon failure or if actually the patient could have overloaded the system. And the second level that led us to form a club of all the companies who are globally interested in that knowledge. And together with them, we, are, it's, we established a dialogue about how, what it takes to bring things forward and realize progression and uh, translation. What have we learned in that interaction? We are always thrilled by what we can measure and how we can progress with our measurements. And we are having fun with those patients, uh, just believe it. The industry is eager in the novelty of our findings, but only if it actually helps them to de-risk their strategies and their concepts. They want to have super reliable information. They want to understand the knowledge that we gain. And they want to be very clear about the technology and the sensitivity, specificity, and the accuracy of our system. It, the knowledge that we generate is only relevant for them once it is actually integrating easily into the existing processes and companies. New knowledge is relevant for them if it helps them to compensate or reduce the existing risks that they experience and that they see. And for new products, they are interested in a substantial progress towards reducing the risk that they have as a company. And that risk minimization point was one of the first findings that I realized as a different perspective to the classical academic thinking that we usually have. We are curiosity driven and that is great and that should stay, 
But we need to understand that the partners that we need on the translation chain, the companies, are in a different mode and they are looking in a different way. I'd like to give you a second example, and that's um, about bone healing implants. We are very proud that we realized an implant that is a drug eluting stent. So an implant that can target infection. And as you see here, 70% on a global scale of fractures are for open fractures see a contamination with environmental bacteria. Bacteria, fungi, and the immune reaction is a big topic nowadays specifically, but is also already for a long time as infection cases in implants, and especially after fracture treatments. We realized and managed that this product is globally available. It changed the way how treatment is done, and it's called Expert Tibial Nail Protect and it's sold by one of the leaders in the field on a global scale. And it's a work of Britt Wildemann and Gerd Schmidtmeier. How did it come across? We basically started in 1998. They basically started with adapting a concept that was made and realized in the uh, kernel stent area with coated stents. Um, we performed preclinical analyzes, mainly DFG funded in small animals and large animals. And the initial vision was actually trying to, and the patent filed, was actually um, trying to release growth factors to enhance healing. The company licensed that patent, and the idea was really in the beginning to boost healing. But then we ran into a problem that was really a very important experience for me. We had our patent, but we had no freedom of operation, because if you want to use any of the growth factor proteins on the market, you have to buy licenses to them. All our basic research work that we did with DFG funding in animals was basically trying to show that BMP is better, a local drug release of protein BMP, or even a combination of TGF better and IGF-1. You need to understand that each of them costs roughly 60 million as a patent license, and you haven't produced the product at that stage. So there is no way a health economical assessment would survive and that you can actually show that your product is worth that much of money. We had a handover and the biggest second challenge was upscaling the production at the company and really have it as a solid system running. And a third and probably the major challenge was in the FDA approval, each of those products, like the nail that is shown here, produced 20 square meters full of folders uh, in the approval process of the FDA, and it costs roughly 20 millions to get that approval realized for each implant. And that's the second point where we really got a bloody nose because we realized that tibia nail is fine, but now everybody wants to have the same system for a femoral fracture, a humerus fracture, a whatever, jaw fracture. Each of them would produce this amount of money and that amount of effort to get it realized. But that was actually not the biggest challenge that we saw. That product, if you look at the web page and look it up, if you look for the intended use that's defining what the product actually stands and what it actually delivers, you don't see a single word of treating infection. It's basically the same term that it is there for the non-coated regular implant. Why? Because there is no way that a randomized controlled multicentral trial would ever show that a 4% infection rate can be treated or reduced by that nailing concept. So there is actually no chance and no budget available to prove for such a system that the major claim actually works. Coming back to medical need, you need to be very well aware of your medical need. You need to have a clear definition of the medical need and that's key to defining all the next steps, including your hypothesis. What we learned as being very important is having an early health economical assessment. If you are in the early stage, you can actually switch maybe for your medical need, a therapy with a protein is great, a cell therapy may be great, and IT will be probably a perfect solution. Which one do you take? Also should be reflected by how much value can you actually generate and how much value will be generated with that solution that you have eventually in the market. You shouldn't be too serious about that, but at least you should be aware of that and not learn that only the hard way in the end. That was our problem. Second is we realized we need an opportunity check. 
And we have installed that now in the BCRT. You need an opportunity to check to identify the technology and own IP competence that you can realize. And you need to know how big is your freedom of operation? What are other patterns that you're probably not aware of, but a patent lawyer would be and would tell you that this is not where you can actually do what you would like to do. And finally, you need to identify stakeholders um, that really are the partners in that. And I'm coming to this in a second. And finally, the clinical approval process and which pathway your product actually takes is super relevant. The example that I showed to you is a combinational product. Nowadays has a complete different pathway in Europe than in North America, and you need to be aware of that complexity. I'd like to give a second example on that, and last example on that implant site. Um, in bone healing, and you see here a cut through the bone of a tibia, and um, how the bone healing progresses over time, and you see the cortexes, and you see the callus formation that happens, and the reddish is endoconalusification, a little bit of soft tissues. You see bone healing happens in nine weeks, and it's successful. If you have a different way of stabilization with more shear movement at the fracture, so mechanosensitive, you reduce the shear, you increase the shear, so more instable. Healing is delayed and catches up a little bit and comes also at some point to a healing. So there is mechanosensitivity in the system, if that's the case. So how much mechanical stabilization do we have in a regular implant like a nail that we, everybody would see if you suffer a fracture in the tibia, you would get that implant here, the standard nail. And we realized, well, that has a certain amount of wobbling of the nail and the bolt in the nail, very simple mechanics. And we measured that in sheep and realized how much interfragmentary movement and stability we have in a treated tibia. Here is a nail in between, and we measured the fracture gap movement, the ground reaction forces. And we could realize that with time, you actually have a reduction of the fracture gap movement with a conventional implant and you get that kind of healing. But if you make a very simple thing, you make a little threat, you basically reduce the movement in the gap, in the hole, suddenly the movement is smaller and healing comes faster. But actually, it's still healing in both cases, but healing is faster. Great story. Well, we realized that and it became a product and it's now available, you can buy it. Well, it's realization is it's a bolt with a resolvable um, sleeve but they together basically remove the movement at the fracture gap and support healing. In a large multi-center clinical trial, that was a consequence of that, eight centers, three countries, in 142 cases, there was no difference in healing success, so all of them healed. There was not a higher non-union rate, but that was actually the aim chosen for the clinical trial, but that was not the aim in our preclinical trial. In our preclinical trial, it was speed of healing and not success of healing. If you analyze the data of those cases here, you realize there is a benefit in the non-ASLS, so the non-locked versus the locked system. And actually patients come faster to healing, but in the multi-clinical, multi-central clinical trial, the endpoint was chosen in the wrong way. And actually more interesting, and that was another message learned here, the different centers and the healing speed was substantially different between centers. So centers with high volumes of patients had a high and fast healing, while centers with the fewest or the lowest amount of patients included had the lowest, the slowest healing. So healing speed was not only affected by our mechanics and our wishful thinking and our basic research understanding, but by reality, by being trained to the system and understand the system proper enough. So you need to have a solid basic understanding and a solid basis of your understanding and you need to bring that novel concept into a broader understanding but you need to really take care with whom you do that and how you do that so it's highly relevant what is your initial user group in your clinical trial and also beyond and how to design the study so it's not only you doing the basic research the molecular biology coming to a patent, but also you need to be part of a clinical trial design. That's what we realized, what we really need to take care of. We have to be clear about the potent multipliers and get them on board early. And a couple of trials and a couple of very successful ideas failed because they didn't have the right partners on board. And you need to train the experts to those novel concepts and ensure that they really understand what you have thought of as a basic research idea. And you need to stay always in the loop. It sounds very simple, but we had to really learn it the hard way. 
I'd like to come to another example now moving to the biology. Bone healing is known to be highly relevant or highly affected by the immunity of the patient and that inflammation in the beginning is relevant for healing. Here, Simon Reinke and Sven Geisler realized the concept identifying patients or trying to identify patients that are good healers, fast healers, and patients that are delayed healers. And that whole is based on an analysis of x-rays differentiating patients, a group of patients that all had received or seen a tibial head fracture. We have measured the function, the ground reaction forces. We have taken blood and we have analyzed the hematoma in those patients. Well, we realized that over the time course, there is a group that didn't return to full weight bearing fast enough that were the delayed healing group. And we had a group that was fast healers and that fast healing group um, was very successful. And in the end, the major denominator between the two, and that was an accidental observation, was that they had elevated Tamra levels in the patient that underwent a delayed healing. Tamra cells are from the adaptive immunity. We found them in the serum and Tamra is terminal and differential regulatory T cells. They are part of the CD8 compartment, positive cell compartment. Those cells were higher in the delayed healers, even after fracture healing was finished. And they were also higher compared to a control not fractured patient cohort. We realized that we have a certain accumulation here um, of the Tamara cells in the fracture hematoma compared to the blood levels. We also found in those patients that the CDL positive Tamara cells had a strong expression of interferon gamma and TNF alpha. We had a higher apoptosis of progenitors and a reduced osteogenic potential. And in a mouse model, mice don't have Tamara, but they have CD8 cells. We used mice that had an experienced immune system. Bone healing after 24 days is in the micro CT looking this way. And if you cut, if you cut that image, you see how the cortices are trying to bridge, are about to bridge, haven't completely healed yet. If we add CD8 positive cells, so the bad guys, healing is completely avoided and non-healing is resulting. If we take them out and deplete those CD8 cells, we actually get a better healing and an accelerated healing. So it seems kind of a mechanistic understanding that those guys, Tamara cells might be a relevant prognostic marker potential and eventually the basis for a therapy. As a consequence, we looked for a partner that could help us to realize a clinical management of a diagnostics and enable us to really install a differentiation between standard healers and delayed healers. The vision is patient come to the emergency ward, blood is drawn as it is always drawn anyway. A little box is ticked on the, on the for information and the patients then go to uh, the surgery with the surgeon knowing this is a potential delayed healer versus this is a regular healing situation. We have looked into differentiating our patient groups in a first group of 30 patients and defined the cutoffs and the thresholds and realized that what level we have to identify below or above which we differentiate between good healers and delayed healers. We have a certain specificity and sensitivity identified and we have then in a first prospective run validation with 70 patients looked into a cutoff of 38% and came to a sensitivity of 70 and a specificity of 95. As a consequence, we have initiated a multi-center clinical trial that is coordinated and organized now with um, the two, Sven uh, Geisler and Simon Reinke. And we have already 515 patients in now in March. Uh, we have a dropout rate which is pretty small. We have an endpoint where healing is about to happen, where we have 35% of not yet healed patients. And we have a second endpoint that is behind what we would consider a non-union, where we have a surprising 18% of non-union cases. That's a pretty high number. We're waiting for the unblinding to verify that really our predictive marker is telling us the full story. Already now, we have learned certain lessons. We have a fantastic technology developer at hand with Beckman Coulter who helps us to go into the realization of that diagnostics. But that diagnostic company is active in the diagnostic market. They are by no means active in the surgical environment. We have market access with 
a second partner that we had to bring in because they have no market access, but they have the technology. We brought in a company that has market access and they know how to talk to the surgeons, but they have no technology ownership. The intended use that we formulated is much longer than the case that I showed to you earlier. And um, it is basically illustrating um, a long process of roughly two months between the two companies and us to formulate what is really a common understanding of what we have here. What is the lessons learned? We have an idea and we have a concept that includes the basic science understanding. We have a translation reached, but honestly, that translation was only possible because we have established a trust between partners. And that's something which I found super relevant because you don't only deal with companies, you, do with, you deal with real people. And as a scientist, you need those company competences and knowledges and the trust in those people. The role of those people in their organization is super relevant and companies move and change very fast. It's about trust and it's about a longer standing partnership that you require because any of those processes takes you easily two to three to four years or more. We have really learned that the stakeholders are diverse. So technology ownership, market access and sales capabilities are substantially different and the competences are different. And none of that was something that I was so heavily involved. But you as a scientist who wants to become that, this is becoming reality. You have to push it and drive it. In companies, they have within big companies anyway different languages. We talk a different language. And even if it comes down to sales strategies, that is a heavily relevant element. And that's something where we actually have to be innovative and actually drive that I, those ideas forwards. It's by no means that the companies really can do that because they don't understand the, the problem as deeply as probably we can understand and unravel it. Our tech transfer is helpful. You need to have an own IP strategy and you need to start early with developing an own understanding of what the business idea could be. I was surprised. I was expecting companies would take a more active role in this, but that's actually not really the case. I'd like to show you another example. And this time from muscle regeneration. We have learned from bone healing that inflammation is essential, that scar free healing is possible, but muscle and other mesenchymal tissue is not able to scar free heal. Could we actually make muscle heal scar less or scar free like bone can? If we would understand the early phases of muscle regeneration or the lack thereof, Maybe we have tools in our hand if we compare them to bone healing. When is muscle regeneration relevant? And that's what Timo Kazi, a former postdoc, and Sven Geisler looked into. So for example, after hip replacement surgery, you always have to go to the hip. And after that, you have a lack of muscle because you go through that, pro that, that muscle structure, you cut it open. Even with very conservative technologies, you have to go through. And as a consequence, you have a fibrotic, fatty degenerating muscle structure. Little if you're very careful, more if you're less careful as surgeon. You have other reasons why muscle trauma occurs and you wanna get back to an intact muscle structure. We believe that an anti-inflammatory strategy is essential to initiate regeneration and healing and that this is the basis to avoid a fatty degeneration that comes later. That this can be true is something that we analyzed in a rat model system with the biomaterial and the local delivery of stroma cells, where we could show that those stroma cells can be actually boosted by a local additional release of VEGF and IGF and a paracrine factors that they relieve together with, release together with the stimulating factors can realize an environment that is anti-inflammatory and pro-regenerative in a muscle in a rat model system. We have shown that this system works. We have published the work and we could show that in terms of function, in terms of muscle generating capacity, the transplantation of the stem cells over the time course of 28 and 56 days, the blue is alginate with stem cells, the red is with doped stem cells that see the growth factors, the regeneration reaches close to 80, 90% of the contralateral intact muscle site, which is quite a good result for such a situation that otherwise would by no means heal and regenerate. We saw that the scouring is substantially reduced. It's not gone, 
but it's roughly at 10% over it is in the regular situation, roughly 25%. So we have a reduction of scouring, not completely gone yet, but it works. So as a basis of that, we said, well, if that's the case, how do we do stem cell therapy in our patients? Well, maybe there is a stem cell off the shelf. And we've teamed with a company from Israel, the company Pluristem, that have placenta-derived stem cells, stroma cells. They call them PLX. And they've shown in an earlier study that those cells can be extended, uh, expanded, can be realized, and products can be made that help enlist limp ischemia patients to avoid amputation. We said, well, if that works in amputation cases of limp ischemia, maybe it works also in muscle regeneration. So placenta cells are harvested, expanded, produced, and finally made available to an injection into the muscle. We looked into our RAD model system, that's the work of Tobias Winkler jointly with Dieter Volk, and we could show that if we inject them after inflammation is gone, the PLX cells actually in fast switch and tetany substantially boost compared to the non-treated, sham-treated group, and actually that this also holds true if we have an immediate injection, uh, so not only waiting until inflammation is gone, but actually in the, in, in the inflammatory environment if we inject them early. With that basis, we went to advice at the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Frankfurt. We said, well, this is in limp ischemia used. We would like to use that in a muscle injury that is very common, <laughs> basically supporting muscle regeneration after joint replacement surgery in revision cases. We know the cells help in an angiogenic potential or have an angiogenic potential. We have shown and seen that they have a reduction in inflammation as a consequence and they have a specific muscle regenerating capacity. If we would use them, <coughs> we could actually support healing and we would like to do that in revision cases because they really result in massive scouring. At that advice event with the Paul Ehrlich Institute, the Paul Ehrlich people suggested to us to use primary hip replacement patients, which made it much easier for us. And we started our phase 1-2-A trial with the PLX, PLAT, PAT cells, in 20 patients, and we had three groups, a placebo group, an intermediate dosage with 150 million cells, and a high dosage with 300 million cells. So patients, patients see a joint replacement surgery, that's illustrated here, and when we finish surgery, we inject the cells to support the muscle regeneration. Interesting, the high dose and the intermediate dose both have a beneficial effect on the muscle generating capacity so the moment that the muscle can generate the gluteal muscles is increased over the time course compared to the control group that had placebo also the muscle volume increases and if you look carefully in both cases the light green the 150 million were better than the dark green the 300 millions what is actually happening on the systemic level? CD4 positive cells. If you do surgery, the number of CD4 positive cells that are beneficial for regeneration are diminishing. But if you do your treatment, you basically, we see two hours after surgery, a recop of the CD4 positive cell group and actually recovers. And interesting for both group, it recovers in a later phase after seven days. So it works for the good guys, and it supports them to regain and come back and it avoids to a certain amount the stress that the patient would see otherwise. But why are the 300 million better than the 150? Less good than the 150, sorry. The plasma, plasma IL-10 actually shows us the results. So what we see is we have an increase of plasma IL-10 two hours after surgery. In both cases, both cell groups are good. But apparently, and we think because of more cells dying, because we offer too many cells, we have a recop of the IL-10 in the patients that saw the 300 million. So we see that the 150 seems to be kind of the sweet spot where enough cells are there to give the positive effect and not enough, not too many cells of those that we give die and have not any opposing effects in later phases. What have we learned? Well, it works to boost muscle regeneration. But what we also learned is it actually reduces the surgical stress. Surgical stress, where is that actually a major massive issue? And we realized that we can adjust our medical need, unmet medical needs. And we said, we don't go for elective joint replacement surgery. 
we actually see the biggest benefit in femoral neck fractures because those patients have seen see a muscle trauma in the intraoperative setting, but they have had already a fracture. And those patients are usually sarcopenic and because they're elderly patients. So they are at risk of being immob immobilized and they have a surgical stress and they are frail. So what we try now to target is not muscle generating forces. Yes, that's also a beneficial effect, but we target now high mortality that those patients see. Can we reduce mortality in those patients? And we applied for funding and we got funding from Horizon 2020 for the HipGen project that Tobias is uh, very actively coaching and organizing. We have a large network of people. The focus is rip, hip, total hip arthroplasty and hemiarthroplasty in those fracture cases. We have the administration uh, of inter intramuscular for those cells. Um, and we do 10 injections and we have a plan of 240 patients included. We have started in September 2018 with the first patient in. And we are now, already in November last year, we had 50 patients enrolled. We are now suffering hope that we can control and keep everything going um, for the current corona crisis and keep as many patients included as possible. What have we learned in that loop? Well, it was actually refined translation. We had done our basic research. We have done our understanding and technology. We brought everything together. We had our basic understanding. We went into the clinic in a phase one, two trial and learned that actually a different clinical medical need may be even more benefiting from that. And we went back and now are back in a phase one, a phase three trial. That is something which sounds probably very familiar to you and very easy, but that's unique to university medicine. In university medicine, we can do exactly that loop. Companies cannot do that loop by themselves. We see the patients, we see the problem, and we can adjust. And we can also do the same, not only in the indication, but also in the therapeutic product. And Petra Reinke has very nice examples where she adjust, adjusted the product in such cascades and had an optimized product in the end. In this case, we had an optimized indication. So refined translation is a lesson that we learned. What it takes is you need to have a sound idea and concept based on the basic science understanding. You certainly need your IP, identify the technology that you need, and you need probably a technology provider. And what we learned in that example and in many, many other examples in the BCR team, you need to seek advice early. Don't make your thing ready to go and then go through the authorities. We really favor a very early contact with the Paul Ehrlich Institute or the EMA or the FDA or any authorized bodies if it's a medtech product or an IT. You need to have at that stage, when you talk to them, your technology defined. Many people are still not freezing the technology there, and then you get, don't get a proper advice. You need the definition of the approval process, because in many cases, the approval path may not be so clear to you and the authorities that you actually need to get a clear advice. And you are able with such an approach to identify remaining gaps and really know what is needed. And maybe what you'd love to do as a next step is not what is really needed to de-risk your idea and make it a reality. And what we learned here, the positive way, this time it was really only positive. The definition of patient cohorts was opened by the Paul Ehrlich Institute in a way that we didn't expect in the beginning. To wrap up, what we think is essential in we learned that in regenerative medicine, but we think it's broader for medicine in general. To do translation, you need to take risks. And that's something which is probably very relevant, especially at those days in which we are at the moment, where we don't really know how to tackle the corona crisis in the most efficient way and how to identify patients at risk early enough. We need to take a certain way of a risk to understand what is actually the challenge. And you need to go into prototyping of solutions and visualize and share those ideas. And that's for PhDs and postdocs in early phase of careers, certainly a substantial challenge, but it's also a challenge for very experienced scientists. You need to be emotional and subjective because you need to look beyond your own field. Maybe you have a great solution for that medical need, but maybe somebody else has also a great solution for the same medical need, but uses a completely different, different technology and approach. And you need to be able to take frustration and risks and deal with them. 
you need to have early access to people experienced in clinical affairs. And we have installed a structure at the BCRT here where we have a one-stop service, how to provide you with support to get to your clinical approval. And you need to have an early health economic assessment in that. And you need to have an opportunity check, and that's also installed here at the BCRT, where you have people who are knowledgeable in business development, who are knowledgeable in reading patterns and opportunities. And all that together basically is only possible if you have a mindset of de-risking and steering towards translating your ideas, and if you have infrastructures in place. Because I didn't talk so much about infrastructures, I'd like to end with uh, what we are envisioning here and how do we drive, want to drive the whole concept forwards. We'd like to realize what we have realized in, or we'd like to continue defining what we have realized in the BCRT, that we, the building with the institutes is called the Kranach House, where we have all those competences, including the Reddit School on board. And we realized that we need more GMP facilities. And we're very happy that Petra Reink is fighting so heavily for the BCAT with the whole team in the background where we will have then a huge number of GMP facilities to make those biological combinational products available to patients in phase one up to phase two, eventually phase three clinical trials. We're happy that together with the TU, we are building on the simulated human on model systems for the human because we learn more and more that the mice models are not the adequate systems that really allow us to de-risk ideas and really understand our patient's characteristics of a disease. Those three structures are illustrated here by the greenhouses don't work alone. They need partner clinic and partner institutes in the region, clinics within Charité, but also the Max Planck, the Heisenberg, the, the Helmholtz institutions um, the Fraunhofer institutions around us. We need R&D networks that allow us to have a clinical driven basic research in the background as a basis, the simulation of human model systems and advanced therapies enablers like the BCAT. We know that we need for that also inspiration ideas. We have realized an Einstein center on regenerative therapies where new ideas can be born and people are brought together. We know that we need to educate the people and that's why we have a greater system. And we know that we need business development, clinic affairs teams in a translational hub structure. All that is intended to be a campus for patients that seek advice and help for the best students possible and certainly for the best scientists that we can gain for such an endeavor. And we envision that this is a campus for people and for research and development in regenerative medicine. I hope I could tell you a little bit and give you a certain insight into what we're doing and I'm hoping uh, to hear some questions and hoping that I'm able to give answers to those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georg. I hope um, I can be heard now. This is uh, Ulrich Diernagel again um, and I'm moderating yeah. this uh, video conference. So, um, just a reminder, uh, we are accepting or actually hoping for questions and they need to come in via the chat. So, please uh, send your questions. We have one. I will start questions uh, in a moment. Send them in and if uh, there, there is a, a button and says uh, to whom and please press organizer. So, uh, then this will be forwarded to us. Maybe, Georg, you can check in the chat. There could be some to the moderator and it seems that you are the moderator. So, if you have questions in your chat, um, uh, we don't see them and you could you could ask them. Um, uh, can you hear me, uh, Georg? Yes, I hear you, ah, um, but I don't see any additional okay. questions. Good. So, so let's start. Um, there is one question that I have received so far and uh, the question is whether uh, the observations uh, in the EMA phase 1-2 study uh, depends on patient gender and age. Um, the, I assume that goes back to the um, muscle regeneration trial. Um, there is a uh, we, we cannot exclude that uh, patient gender plays a role. Um, we, um, the, because the initial group was relatively small with um, the um, patients 776 in the different groups, um, 
but we cannot exclude that uh, there is a certain gender difference um, between the different patient cohorts. From what we see at the moment uh, from the larger clinical trial as it goes, and we are blinded, so we don't know who saw what, we have a much better, obviously a much better balanced general situation, but I cannot really say if there will be a gender specific influence. Uh, bias by age, also there, I, I don't know. We, what we know is that more advanced experienced immune system is what, or the, it's the, not, the, the age of the immune system is not depending of, of, on your years of age. So you may be a young person and have an advanced experience, experienced immune system. Um, if you are, however, at an older age, the chance that your, experience, uh, that your immune system is very experienced is relatively high. So there might be a difference between the phase one, two trial and the effect that we see in the aging population, which we think would be more beneficial for the therapy outcome or the effect of the therapy. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, while we are still waiting for uh, chat questions, don't be shy. Um, I have one to you um, and we have heard uh, quite impressive uh, experience that you have collected over the years with I think in particular with devices and advanced uh, therapeutic and medical products. Um, but uh, but there's also a third category, at least in my uh, understanding, then these are the classical drugs. So could you just give us some idea how different those processes that you described uh, would be in those different categories? Yeah, that's that's a very good point, um, and I didn't really allude on that. So the RTMP, the Advanced uh, Medical Medicinal Products uh, category, is um, where the cell-based strategies, the cell material-based strategies, would be kept, and they are basically dealt with like regular or, or very similar, at least in within boundaries, very similar to pharmaceutical products in the sense that you go through the classical phase one, two, three, et cetera, cascades. Uh, and the focus is in the initial run more on the safety side. What we have seen with pharmaceutical products um, as well as also with vaccinations, um, however, the, the patient groups that you deal with and the risk benefit evaluations are um, in many cases, at least to the experience that I have seen with the ATMPs, on a different level and in a different setting. So the experience with pharmaceutical products is so much bigger that the rules and the regulations and the framework there is very stable and sound. Uh, in ATMPs, it is now, it became very sound and stable, but it was a process over the last couple of years where also the authorities learned how that process could be done with living cells and how to reduce the risk at the same time for patients, at the same time allowing benefits to gain. And that's why it's not an identical process like in the pharmaceutical field. And it's, a, to my personal impression and my experience, a much more dialogue-oriented interaction. And you really talk to scientists at the Paul Ehrlich Institute or at the EMA, with whom you really can discuss, especially if you come from an academic environment, discuss therapeutic opportunities and chances and risks. Okay, so thank you very much. The major difference is the dialogue. Okay, um, we have, we are, we are almost uh, uh, at the hour, so we need to wind down. Uh, we have now, uh, now the, the audience is waking up. I have three questions now. We should close questions now, but we could try to get answers for those three, um, and I will try to shorten them, and maybe you can sh give short answers. Or try, um, So let's start with um, the first one. If you said that much money was needed uh, when you were talking about the story about the nail, when yeah. you start a cooperation with a company to realize a therapy, how can you share the costs? Um, Oh, that's a very good point. Um, the, uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, the, and, and that might be substantially different uh, in, in whatever endeavor you are. And, and if somebody, and if I'm answering now proper and not proper enough, please send me an email to duda at charite.de and I'm happy to explain that more in detail. Um, medtech devices, first of all, medtech devices are in a different market situation than pharmaceutical products and uh, also ATMPs and combinational products. 
Um, MedTech Germany is at the moment the low budget market on the globe. Uh, much, many other markets are much more attractive. And that's why um, it's very hard at the moment to get companies in Germany or in Europe engaged to fund and invest in you and in your research. What we see more and more, and that's also why we believe, and that's why we have this DFG position paper also positioned, uh, we believe that we need an academia mm -hmm. environments that allow us to realize prototypes of ideas, even without a company, and show that they work, so de-risk the idea. And so my direct answer would be, at the moment, I think it would be the, probably the best, the worst moment to approach companies to get funding. There are much better ways to get funding at the moment from Federal Research Ministry, eventually sometimes also DFG, uh, some other foundations to make a prototype and show that your idea actually flies. Companies have the trend to go very late in and buy in you and share the costs. Okay, thank you. Next one is shorter, and and uh, I think uh, you have a, a an answer for it. Um, you mentioned the uh, stem cell treatment uh, in muscle healing after a hip transplant. How would you propose to administer them? Uh, and the proposal here is together with the new hip joint, or what's what's the strategy? At the moment, the muscle regeneration is really integral part uh, of the surgery, so we really administer them in the joint revision surgery or the fracture treatment of a frail patient uh, after a, a femoral neck fracture. And we really administer the cells when we have the surgical process, uh, closing the wound and suturing. And then once the muscle is sutured, then the cells are administered. Um, that once that clinical approval process is through, and if that shows uh, to be beneficial as we hope, then lots of other indications in terms of muscle injury may be well taken and may well go beyond what we have selected for that clinical trial at the moment. Okay, so the last question is, uh, I guess, uh, asking about the Charité environment, I'm not quite sure. It says, any research about skin regeneration? Um, there is a little bit of skin research, or there is skin research also here, and there is um, a lot of experience with treating skins, uh, as you know, at, at uh, the UKE, UKB in, in Marzahn. Uh, so there is lots of clinical expertise in Berlin, and there is a little bit of also experimental work towards the skin. And it's, I, I believe, an area which we haven't taken as much in the focus as we should. And I think it is something to go deeper. Um, it, it's not my, my core personal uh, focus, but I think it's something where a lot of gain can be made and a lot of benefit. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to apologize to those who have sent in questions now uh, but for the sake of time i think we have to close down um, but i'm sure if uh, uh, you send these questions to georg uh, via email as he has already mentioned he will be happy to address them um, i would uh, in particular like to thank uh, georg um, for for his uh, very interesting talk and the discussion i would like to uh, thank patricia ebel for uh, arranging this uh, novel format. Uh, I, I hope it uh, worked for you reasonably well and I thank you for joining even though there were no sandwiches, at least there were no sandwiches provided by the organizers. Maybe some of you had sandwiches <laughs> while Georg was talking. So um, thank you very much and I, I would like to remind you um, that next uh, the next lecture will probably be on uh, May 15th it's, um, I, I have no title yet, but uh, it's in planning. And uh, there will be, uh, I think, uh, uh, mails and, and some advertisements for it. So um, stay healthy uh, and have a good time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That Bye -bye. was a great talk.